Welcome, friends, to the first FCNL training program as we prepare for the Quaker Public Policy Institute and Lobby Day on November 14th and 15th of this year. I want to also welcome Emily Worsba, who is our lead lobbyist on the environment and one of our best lobby trainers. Today, we are going to be talking about talking to folks and particularly to friends for whom this is your first time at annual meeting or you just want a refresher on what you need to do to prepare to lobby at FCNL's Quaker Public Policy Institute and Lobby Day. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about what you're going to see at annual meeting and what you can do before to get geared up for what we think is going to be one of the most exciting lobby days that we've ever had. And it couldn't come at a better moment because we're bringing 500 people to Washington, D.C., right as Congress will be making important decisions about whether or not Congress is going to reassert its authority over when our country goes to war. In other words, on ending endless wars. So I'm going to stop there for a minute and ask Emily to talk to us a little bit about why this lobby training is so important. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, really excited to speak with you all. Uh, we want you to be as prepared as possible for your lobby day. Um, and so we wanted you to start thinking about your lobbying now, um, but also to reiterate that this is just the beginning. Um, Jim and I have been planning the lobby trainings for the Quaker Public Policy Institute for weeks already, um, so you all will be as prepared as possible. Um, but it's important for you to really just start thinking about this now. And I want to remind everyone um, that you can go to our website, fcnl.org slash qppi for the recording of this training, but also other materials about lobbying in the conference. And Emily, when folks get to annual meeting, they're going to get a whole series of trainings anyway about what, what specifically we recommend and all of those kind of details. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. So you'll get trained on what the ask is, so you can be prepared and comfortable. You will be connected with your state delegation, so you can meet the people you're going to be lobbying with. You'll get to plan your visit with them. Um, you'll have lots of different types of trainings to make you feel as prepared as possible. Well, great. And it might be, as we start, just a brief explanation of why we do this work. As a 76-year-old Quaker lobby in the public interest, we start our advocacy from a place of faith, from a belief that war is not the answer, and that ending endless wars is something that we are called to do as part of our faith, as part of our values. We also work hard to engage in a practice of lobbying that's grounded in Quaker faith and practice, and specifically that seeks to engage with everybody in Congress, seeks to build a connection with every single member of Congress and then look for openings that we can find for Quakers that's looking for that of God in the other person. For all of you coming to Washington, D.C., we hope that you'll come with an opening to try and figure out what new possibilities may emerge in your own lobby visits. And what I'll say is what we have found is that that openness, grounded in a place of faith, has actually allowed us to really work with our community to accomplish astonishing things, to pass legislation on peace building that was signed into law by President Trump earlier this year, to pass legislation in this endless war era, era or issue focused on trying to end U.S. support for the Saudi war in Yemen, and on many of the climate issues that Emily works on. We've had seen great progress. So as you get prepared, I hope you'll also prepare yourself in terms of in terms of your own practice of both stating your truth and also listening to the truth of others, and particularly the congressional staff. Now, one other thing I'll say that we often talk about is bring your hats. When you come to lobby, you're coming to lobby with the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and you're also coming with your other community connections. And when you go into a congressional office, Members of Congress and their staff often know about the issue we're lobbying on, but what's unique about your own story is partly 
where do you come from and where are you in the community? So if you have a hat that says you're a parent or you went to school there or you're a member of a Quaker meeting or you own a business or you've just lived there for 30 years, that's a good hat to bring with you and to remember when you go into that co congressional office because that'll help them understand your grounding in the community. So Emily, I hope you could perhaps define for us and for our audience, what does a successful lobby visit look like? Yeah, that's a really important question. There are lots of different components um, that make up a successful lobby visit. Um, so we would like to just walk through a couple of those examples. Um, so the first is you need to know who your members of Congress are and where they stand on the issue that you're going to be talking about. So do your research ahead of time. And again, at the conference, we'll also help you do that research if you need it. Um, you want to know the ask. And you want to, we have to emphasize here, you have to stick to the one ask. I know it will be very tempting to talk about many issues, um, but, but know the ask well that we're focusing on this conference, which again is ending endless war. And make sure that you repeat the ask multiple times throughout the course of your visit. Um, you want to be able to connect your story, your faith and your values to that ask, and practice what you're planning on saying in your visit. So again, we'll have lots of trainings at the conference to help you do this, but think about What's motivating you to come all the way to Washington, D.C. to talk to your members of Congress about this important issue? Tell, tell that story. We really want you to report back to us after, the, after your lobby visit how it went, because our lobbyists need to be able to follow up with the Congressional Office um, and, and know what, what information you've gathered, because you're our best source of information here. Um, and then finally, we want you to think about a lobby visit as a first step in developing a long-term relationship. We want you to follow up with the Congressional Office, to ask questions, to stay in touch, um, to see if they've committed to the ask or not, um, and, to, and to think of this as a, a long-term relationship building process. So Emily, just I asked you before, but I just want to stress this because we did say this is for particularly new friends who are coming to the Quaker Public Policy Institute. If, um, that sounds like a lot. How do I, how am I going to keep track of this? Am I going to get more training when I come? to yes. FCNL, it'll help me sort of map this out? Absolutely, so we have an amazing document at FCNL called the Lobby Visit Roadmap. And this will be a guide to how you structure and set up your lobby visit. So it'll list out kind of all the different pieces and components of a successful lobby visit. And it will help you and your state delegation plan who's gonna be in charge of saying what. And you're also gonna have lots of chances to practice and actually do a role play um, where you'll get to practice saying out loud, out loud in the proper order what you plan to say. So we'll definitely help everyone do that. That's great. And I know that uh, our colleague Justin Hurdle is schedule is working with teams around the country to schedule those visits. And if people have questions before, they can reach out to Justin. And his email is jhurdle, J-H-U-R-D-L-E, at F-C-N-L dot O-R-G. And I'll repeat that again at the end. There are different times that the lobby visits will be, and we'll have lobby trainings that you and I will be at on Wednesday night and Thursday morning, and then a big gathering on Thursday afternoon. And then Justin and all of us will be available as well. I had a couple of other questions. Yeah. If friends are coming with a, with a group of people, and it's a fairly large group of people, and you're meeting with one congressional staff, what do, do, does everybody speak in the visit, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends on how large the delegation is. Um, typically, if it's a group of, you know, five or six people, everyone will get a chance to speak. If, it's, if you're coming with a delegation of 30 or 40, um, everyone might not get to speak at every single visit, but that's why we break people out into their states to plan in advance. And so maybe half the group speaks to one Senate office and the other half speaks at the second Senate visit. So we make sure that if you really want to speak, we can find a role for you, but when the larger delegations happen, sometimes your, your meeting might only be 10 or 15 minutes. Other times you might get an hour. So, but the, the average meeting will be around 15 minutes. And so we really have to be concise with how many people get to speak. That's helpful. And another question that I've heard a lot is, what happens if I'm talking to a congressional staffer or a member who is not in agreement with where I am or where FCML is on that issue? You, you're someone who lobbies on the Hill all the time. What's your recommendation for people in that circumstance? 
So we always recommend that people start their lobbying with a thank you. This can be really challenging sometimes, but it's so important because FCNL's lobbying is grounded in respectful dialogue and relationship building. So it's your job to really seek that of God in that legislator or congressional staffer um, to find that one thing that you can thank them for genuinely, um, because that will set the tone for the rest of the visit. Um, I think also it's important to remember that you might not flip your member from being a no all the way to a yes in one meeting, but there are other th ways that you can have important influence. So maybe you get them to be less vocally opposed to what we're doing, or maybe you ask them to just stay silent on the issue rather than giving four speeches against the issue. So we will help you kind of think through that, but it's really important that even if you disagree, you keep the conversation respectful, you ground it in a thank you, and you acknowledge that this is the first visit in a longer relationship that you're trying to build, that over time you're hoping to shift this number of times. And, and I think it comes back to the grounding of this community over 76 years, which has really sought to work with uh, everybody in Congress and tried to figure out where the openings are. And as a faith community, I think we have some comparative advantages, which I know you've talked about before, Emily, and certainly from my perspective, that openness to having a conversation with people and to seeing where the conversation may go creates uh, surprises sometimes mm -hmm. that you don't expect. I'm remembering a time earlier this year when we had a, a constituent flying in for a meeting with a member of Congress and we thought, this member of Congress really isn't gonna change at all. And this is someone who built up a relationship with this member of Congress and they met with the chief of staff and the chief of staff said, well, I don't think my member of Congress is gonna agree with you on this, but tell me what you, I have respect for you all and what the Quakers are doing. Tell me where you are and why this is important. And two days later, that member of Congress became the, an additional vote that we hadn't expected wow. on that piece of legislation. And so we do see those openings, and I know you've seen some of those openings, uh, lobbying for climate that come out of creating a space where you can have a conversation. I would also say that there, members of Congress in general are looking for ways to agree with you. And one of my favorite uh, quotes from a few years back now was, we were lobbying on one issue and some local constituents went, who may be at annual meeting, I don't know, um, went and met with this uh, senator at that time. And he said, well, I'm not gonna agree with you on this but I look forward to the time when we agree and we can work together on something. And the next year, they actually did work together on something that we ended up passing a couple of years later. And so those are the kinds of openings, but it takes hard work. It takes actually having a commitment to being willing to talk to people that you don't agree with on everything. And I think that's a comparative advantage that we have as a FCNL community and a gift that we can share with people. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that's that's absolutely right. And I think it's really important to remember, members of Congress don't expect you all to be issue experts. They, they know that maybe you don't have a PhD in ending endless war. That's okay. The reason that they want to hear from you is because you're a constituent, you represent your community. Um, they want to hear more about your personal story and your values and why this should be brought to their attention. And so I think that's just a really important reminder, especially for first-time lobbyists. You're not gonna necessarily debate the technical details. Um, they're there to hear your story and your, your personal values. I think that perhaps is the most important lesson of all, that really, mm -hmm. I always say, your lobby visit should be 50% about you and 50% about the issue, not more. We wanna remind friends that are calling in that are listening to this video as it's recorded um, that we're gonna have another training next Tuesday, October 15th at 4.30, and there should be details on our website. I think we mentioned that website before, but I'll just uh, mention it again, fcnl.org, and then slash, and then QPPI. Again, QPPI. And if you have questions about your lobbying, Justin is really the person who's keeping track of all of this and keeping us all knowing who's going where and all of that. And so 
You can reach out to Justin Hurdle. His email is jhurdle, J-H-U-R-D-L-E, at fcnl.org. Thank you to all of you for listening to this video and watching it if you are able. And we look forward to seeing all of you at annual meeting and to working with you. Thanks again. Thank you.